You know, you see all those Shakespeare portraits, the rough, that serious look, and it makes you wonder, what if it's all a bit of a mask, right? Like there's someone else behind those famous plays. Hmm. Intriguing thought. It is. And that's exactly what we're diving into today. The idea that William Shakespeare might not have been William Shakespeare. A literary conspiracy. I'm intrigued. Tell me more. Okay, so our source is this book, The True Shakespeare, Christopher Marlowe, by Dr. Bastian Conrad. Okay. And his big claim, the real genius holding the quill was actually Christopher Marlowe, another playwright from the same time. Wow, okay. It's one thing to question Shakespeare's authorship, but to say it was Marlowe, that's a whole other level. Right. It's like a literary plot twist. And this isn't just a casual theory. The book really digs into it, building this whole case for Marlowe as the secret mastermind behind some of the greatest plays ever written. So instead of just saying, oh, maybe Shakespeare wasn't really Shakespeare, this book actually tries to connect the dots, linking the plays to Marlowe's life. Exactly. And what I found really interesting is how it picks apart the traditional Shakespeare story, the one we all kind of grew up with. Yeah, we've all heard the name William Shakespeare. Right. Like it's synonymous with genius. <laughs> but this book makes you question everything. So before we really dive into the arguments, let's do a quick recap. Who was Christopher Marlowe? For anyone who might not be familiar. Right, right. So Christopher Marlowe, he was a really brilliant playwright himself, which is you know kind of ironic given the topic. Yeah. And sadly, he died really young, 1593, only 29 years old. Wow. But even with such a short career, he made a huge impact on Elizabethan theater. I mean, plays like Tamperley and the Great, Dr. Faustus, hugely popular, known for being witty. His command of language was incredible. He tackled these really complex themes. Yeah, he was like a rock star playwright of his time. Okay, so we have Marlowe, this rising star, dies in 1593. Here's the thing. Shakespeare's career was already going strong by then. So how could Marlowe be Shakespeare if he died before some of those famous plays were even written? Yeah, that's the million dollar question, right? Yeah. How can someone be writing plays when they're, well, no longer around to write them? Exactly. And this is where the book, The True Shakespeare, takes this sharp turn. It basically says, look, the guy we know as William Shakespeare from Stratford-upon-Avon he couldn't have written those plays. They say there's just not enough historical evidence to back it up. It's yeah. like trying to put together a puzzle, but some of the pieces are missing. Like the book claims that William Shakespeare, and they use that original spelling to kind of make a point. Oh, interesting. That Shakespeare just didn't have the life, the experiences to become Shakespeare. And they point to some pretty specific things. Like what? What kind of things? For one, the book talks about how Shakespeare's family, they were illiterate. Really? Yeah. Like, imagine growing up in a house where nobody's reading, nobody's writing, and somehow you become Shakespeare. Yeah, it's a bit of a head-scratcher. Right. And it gets even weirder. Despite centuries of research, tons of scholars digging through everything, we haven't found one single manuscript, letter, not even a doodle in Shakespeare's handwriting that says, hey, I'm writing this amazing play. So there's no real paper trail. No smoking quill. Nothing. It's like this giant literary void where Shakespeare should be. It does make you wonder. And if he wasn't the one writing those plays, how does someone with his background, you know, if he was illiterate, how could he write about all the things Shakespeare wrote about? That's the encyclopedic knowledge problem, right? The mm. plays are packed with all these details about court life, foreign languages, classic literature, even like obscure history. Yeah. How could Shakespeare, with his seemingly limited background, know all that stuff? It's been the source of debate for ages. It's almost like uh, Dr. Conrad saying that this lack of like a literary paper trail makes it you know, pretty unlikely that Shakespeare was the true author. Yeah, exactly. It's a real head scratcher. So we have this missing author, this giant gap in literary history. And it's no wonder people start coming up with alternative explanations. But even if we like entertain this whole Marlowe is Shakespeare idea, why go through all that trouble? Why fake your own death? Why live under a false name? Well, the book suggests that Marlowe had, you know, some pretty compelling reasons to vanish. Reasons that go back to the whole world of Elizabethan politics. And uh, let's just say it was a dangerous time to be alive. Okay. Dangerous how? Well, Marlowe was facing some serious accusations, like we're talking heresy and treason. The kind of charges that could get you imprisoned, tortured, even executed back then. Oh, okay. It's like something out of a movie. So are we saying Marlowe was like a fugitive from the law? That's exactly what Dr. Conrad suggests. The book kind of paints this picture of Marlowe, fearing for his life, maybe even staging his own death to escape. Okay, now we're getting into conspiracy theory territory. I'm into it. But 
could he really have pulled that off, like faked his own death? And who would even help him with something like that? Well, the excerpt mentions this guy, William Cecil, who was Queen Elizabeth's main advisor as a possible player in all of this. It even hints that Marlowe might have been working as, get this, a secret agent for the crown. Wait, hold on. A playwright and a spy. That's a double life right there. But, like, how do you just disappear, especially when you're someone as well-known as Marlowe? It's not like he could just blend in. That's where our friend William Shakespeare, the businessman from Stratford, comes back into the picture. Mm. And the book suggests that maybe, just maybe, he was more than just a guy with a similar name. You're not saying what I think you're saying, are you? The book does kind of put it out there, the idea that Shakespeare might have been, you know, compensated for the use of his name. So, like, a literary frontman. Yeah, you could say that. The book proposes that he essentially became the face of Marlowe's writing, allowing Marlowe to live on to keep writing, but under a different identity. So instead of just, you know, disappearing, Marlowe's out there writing some of the greatest plays ever, but everyone thinks it's Shakespeare. That's wild. It's a bold claim, for yeah. sure. And it starts to make even more sense when you remember all those questions we had about Shakespeare's background. Yeah. You know, the lack of education, the limited life experiences. Right. Like, how could someone who supposedly never left Stratford write with such detail about, like, the ins and outs of court life? It never quite added up. Exactly. Marlowe, on the other hand, well, he fits the bill much better. He went to university, traveled extensively, and was connected to all the right people. Mm. His experiences, his education, it all aligns much better with the knowledge we see in Shakespeare's work. It's like by trying to figure out if Shakespeare was really Shakespeare, we might have stumbled onto an even more fitting candidate. If Marlowe was actually writing under a different name, it would explain so much. And it goes even deeper. The book actually points out that Marlowe was a master of blank verse, which was a relatively new style of poetry at the time, something he actually helped popularize. And guess what else is famous for its incredible use of blank verse? Don't tell me, Shakespeare. Bingo. Wow, okay. okay. That's a pretty big coincidence. Right. And that's exactly Dr. Conrad's point. He sees this shared mastery of blank verse, along with all these other thematic and biographical links, as pretty strong evidence for Marlowe's authorship. I have to admit, it's getting harder to ignore all these connections. <laughs> but let's be real, we're still in the realm of speculation here, right? I mean, it's one thing to say Marlowe could have been Shakespeare, but actually proving it, that's a whole different story. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. this, this isn't a slam dunk case by any means. But what makes it so fascinating is that the book does try to go beyond just speculation. Like the excerpt we're looking at, it presents what Dr. Conrad believes is concrete evidence that connects Marlowe to Shakespeare in a way that goes beyond just, oh, that's interesting. Okay, so we've talked about why Marlowe might have gone into hiding, how he could have pulled it off. But the big question is, is there any actual proof? Does this book give us something solid to back up this crazy theory? Well, this is where things get really interesting. The excerpt talks about what Dr. Conrad calls textual parallels between Marlowe's work and Shakespeare's. He actually analyzes specific passages, looking at things like, you know, unusual phrases they both use, recurring themes, even little grammatical quirks they seem to share. Like a writing style they both have, something so specific it couldn't be a coincidence. Yeah, like a fingerprint. And the book argues that these parallels, they're way stronger than any similarities you find between Shakespeare and other playwrights from that time. So it's like Marlowe's voice, even though it's supposed to be Shakespeare, kind of shines through. That's the idea. It's like his way with words, his style. It's woven into all these Shakespeare plays. Wow, that's pretty wild. It's one thing to say, oh, they had similar lives, but to find echoes of that in their actual writing, that's something else. But is there more? Or is it just these language things? Oh, there's more. Dr. Conrad, he also points to these biographical echoes he finds in Shakespeare's plays. He says some of the events, characters, even tiny details, they mirror stuff from Marlowe's own life. Mm -hmm. Almost like they were put there on purpose. Hold on. Are we talking secret messages hidden in plain sight now? Like a literary code to crack? I'm thinking Da Vinci code all of a sudden? Right. It's a bit like that. So he analyzes, for example, some of the more obscure characters, little side plots in Shakespeare, and he points out these uncanny resemblances to things, people from Marlowe's life, like the stuff that a regular reader might not even pick up on. So only someone who really knew Marlowe would recognize them? Exactly. It's like these little clues, these hints about the real author yeah. hidden in plain sight. I have to admit, this is getting hard to write off as just coincidence. It's all a bit too much. But isn't it subjective, though? Like, what one person sees as a clear parallel 
someone else might not. Oh, for sure. Textual analysis, it can be a bit like that. It's not an exact science. Yeah, it's like those inkblot tests, right? Everyone sees something different. Exactly. That's why these kinds of theories, they need to be looked at by different experts, you know, literary scholars, historians, maybe even people who study language forensics. It's about building a case, making sure the evidence really adds up. So it's not about being right or wrong. It's more about the mystery itself and trying to understand it better. I think so. And I think that's the beauty of these alternative theories, even if they turn out to be wrong. They make us question what we think we know, dig a little deeper, and look at history with fresh eyes. And in this case, it's not just any history. It's about two of the most famous figures in literature. Whether it was Shakespeare or maybe Marlowe in disguise, those plays are incredible. The language, the characters, the stories they tell, it's all still relevant today. Absolutely. And I think that's what this whole debate shows us. History isn't just dates and names in a book. It's full of mysteries and what ifs and things we might never know for sure. And that's exciting, isn't it? Totally. So was Marlowe Shakespeare. We might never have a definitive answer, but the fact that we're still asking that question after all these years, it just shows how powerful these writers were and how much their work still captures our imagination. Exactly. And ultimately, it's a reminder that great literature, it makes us think, it sparks our curiosity, and sometimes it even makes us question everything we thought we knew.